Hello, I'm JP from the Way Biblical Fellowship, and tonight uh, I started a series that I've been intending to do for uh, a long period of time. Um, we start a series about the book of Hebrews. We look at the first couple of chapters tonight and about the, the things of great significance that are in the book of Hebrews that just aren't commonly picked up upon uh, at all by people who are believers. Look at the, the wonderful treasure trove of uh, insight and revelation that the book of Hebrews is. So I hope you enjoy it. Shalom and welcome to a new series that I'm doing on the book of Hebrews. I'm going to go through uh, the entire book verse by verse, um, and explain some things that perhaps have been hidden from believers uh, for quite a while, either due to uh, doctrinal ignorance or people not understanding uh, the Tanakh or whatever the cause is, the book of Hebrews has become um, probably the most misunderstood Bible uh, book. Um, It's one of the the most mistranslated books. Um, And again, that could be due to doctrinal ignorance of the translators. But I'm going to go through it bit by bit and piece it all together. Um, The book of Hebrews is my favorite epistle in the New Testament. Um, It's amazing because the purpose that it served was to tell uh, the Hebrews about who their Messiah was and to show them all of these things which were now revealed from within the Tanakh. So it it showed who the Messiah was, uh, what the Tanakh said about him. It showed um, that Hasatan had the power of death and how that was taken back from him. It showed uh, the the Israelites in the wilderness having a lack of faith and um, about how this was linked to their obedience. It shows us uh, the earthly tabernacle being patterned after the heavenly one, what that truly actually looks like now that we have the full revelation of the heavenly tabernacle. Um, It showed us about the covenant that was made, about how the people broke the the covenant that was made um, at Sinai. It shows us about the, the new covenant shows us about the the fulfillment of Yom Kippur in the heavenly tabernacle after it's illustrated for us uh, what's going on in the heavenly tabernacle. Um, It shows us so much of the Tanakh in a completely new light. It is an amazing, amazing book, the book of Hebrews. Um, So we'll break that down. We'll go through it bit by bit. And I hope by the end of it, you'll have a completely new respect for a new understanding of the book of Hebrews because it it truly is one of the greatest books um, in Scripture. Before we get into the the verses of Hebrews, just something that I want to look at very, very quickly is something that uh, comes up quite often, the idea of, the authorship of the book of Hebrews. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Do we know who wrote the book of Hebrews? Is it possible to tell? Well, if we just look at the kind of the historical view of the authorship of the book of Hebrews and we'll we'll be able to see where certain ideas come from. Uh, The epistle to the Hebrews was included in the collected writings of Paul from a very early date. For example, the late 2nd century or early 3rd century codex, Papyrus number 46, which is a volume of Paul's general epistles, includes Hebrews immediately after Romans. So it was included in his writings. It was recognized as his writings uh, from very early on. Uh, While the assumption of Paulian authorship readily allowed its acceptance in the Eastern Church, Doubts persisted about it in the West. Eusebius did not directly list the epistle to the Hebrews among the uh, anti-legomena or disputed books, though he uh, included the unrelated gospel uh, of the Hebrews. However, he did record 
that some have rejected the epistle to the Hebrews saying that it is disputed by the church of Rome on the ground that it was not written by Paul so the church of Rome didn't think that it was written uh, by Paul he also recorded the views of Clement of Alexandria uh, that it was written by Paul in Hebrew and later translated into Greek possibly by Luke I think that of all of the books all of the epistles in the New Testament the most likely one to have been written in Hebrew is the book to the Hebrews and there's, there's certainly a lot of evidence that it's been badly translated uh, even into the Greek but that's something that we'll have a look at uh, later on so doubts about Pauline authorship were raised around the end of the second century predominantly in the West Tertullian uh, uh, attributed the epistle to Barnabas so if you've ever heard that the uh, the epistle to the Hebrews was written by Barnabas that's where that idea comes from uh, both Gaius of Rome and uh, Hippolytus excluded Hebrews from the works of Paul the latter attributing it to Clement of Rome Origen noted that others had claimed Clement or Luke as the author but he tentatively accepted Pauline authorship and the explanation of Clement of Alexandria okay so this is kind of this is the history how these things have evolved but even from very early on the very early church fathers didn't know who this book was written by so if anybody comes and claims to know who the book of Hebrews was written by then they simply put they do not have enough evidence upon which to base that claim I'm sure that everybody has got their own reasons for thinking that it was written by Paul or not written by Paul stylistic differences but I think um, anybody that's claiming to have the inside track on it is um, misinformed Jerome, aware of such lingering doubts, included the epistle in the Vulgate, but moved it to the end of Paul's writings. And Augustine affirmed Paul's authorship and vigorously defended the epistle. By then, its acceptance in the New Testament canon was well settled. I think that this, above all of the other epistles, this is one that is absolutely key to being in the New Testament because it explains all of the doctrine uh, that is revealed from the New Testament. Stuff that was there in the Tanakh anyway, but it, it shows us it, it brings it into uh, light more clearly in the light of Yeshua's death. So we begin the letter. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so he's saying, look, previously the word was uh, spoken to us by the prophets. There's not been a prophet for 400 years. Now he's speaking to us by his Son. Okay, and he's not speaking a different message to us by his son than he spoke to us by the prophets who told everybody to repent and turn back to following the law of God. He's speaking the same thing, but now he's speaking through his son. And we can actually see this in um, Matthew 11:13. It says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Okay, this doesn't mean that now the prophets and the law just don't count it was only until John and now the prophets and the law were just done away with. That's not what it's saying. It's saying they were the way that it was, the word was testified to um, up until John. After John, it was testified to, it was prophesied to us by Yeshua. In Luke 20, Yeshua uh, gives a parable. Okay, and he gives a parable that uh, relates basically to Yehovah sending prophets to the people and the people would beat and mistreat the prophets and eventually he sent his son to speak the same message to them it says in verse 9 it says then began he to speak to the people this parable a certain man planted the vineyard and let go to husbandmen 
and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? Okay, they're not listening to the prophets. I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. Did they reverence Yeshua when he came, speaking what the prophets had spoken? But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. Okay, so the leaders of Israel had killed all of the prophets when they'd come with this message. Repent and turn back to following God. Otherwise, things really aren't going to go well for you. Yeshua comes back and he says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's exactly the same message. Our Hebrew starts by saying, Look, Yehovah spoke to us in the past through prophets. Now he speaks to us by his son. What people do is they say, Well, the prophets, they, you know, they were... They were all talking about the law and, you know, all Old Testament stuff. Jesus came and he had a new message. Well, we can see from this parable alone that that's not what happened. Yeshua came and he spoke the exact same thing that the prophets were speaking from the beginning. So the law and the prophets testified until John. Yeshua spoke the exact same word afterwards, but he was the son you would think that people would reverence the fact that the son was saying these things. People have just found a way to reject the fact that the son came and spoke these things though. Okay, in verse two it says that he has appointed him heir of all things. Okay, so just like the, uh, the evil tenants in the parable, they saw the son and they said, this is the heir, okay? Psalm 2, 7 to 8 says, I will declare the decree Yehovah said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Okay, speaking to the son, who is Yeshua, and he says that he's given the uttermost parts of the earth uh, to him for his inheritance, for his possession. Verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 9, I'm going to go ahead a few chapters here because the, the book of Hebrews, it speaks about um, themes that repeat all the way through and the information that's given in uh, the first chapter, say, is repeated and built upon in uh, chapter 9. So when it says here, by himself he's purged our sins, okay, if we're to understand exactly what that actually means, we look at, in Hebrews 9, 13 to 14. This is talking about the difference between the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle, what each one we're supposed to accomplish. And we'll look at that uh, in much more depth when we actually get to chapter nine. But chapter, uh, but verse 13 says, for if the uh, blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God 
purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, so the earthly system was for the purifying of the flesh. His blood, okay, he offered himself for the purifying of our sins. His blood purifies our conscience from dead works, from sin. Okay, so earthly system for the purifying of the flesh. Yeshua for the purifying of sin in as in, in so far as it purifies our conscience okay it does not do what this one does and this one never did what this one did okay they're two separate things okay so it says that um, when he had by himself purged our sins as we know according to the conscience sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high okay so the author of hebrews here is explaining uh, things that we see within scripture that were written about him mark 16 verse 19 says so then after that the lord had spoken unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of god okay Hebrews 1 verse 4 says, Being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Okay, something that we will see as a repeated theme uh, throughout Hebrews is that he was made lower than the angels, but he is better than the angels. Being made lower than the angels is just in reference to the fact that they are ministering spirits there of spirit bodies and he was made according to the flesh so that he could die um, and achieve something that we'll have a look at in a little bit but they he has obtained a more excellent name than the angels ephesians 1 20 to 21 tells us the same thing it says which he wrought in messiah when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion okay so above the angels he sat down at the right hand of god as i said the book of hebrews teaches us all of these things which are written in the new testament it teaches us all of them in one book it's basically just an explanation to the people who previously had uh, the tanakh the old testament um, as their scripture basically expounding upon that and revealing all the things that are hidden in it. it you could just have the book of hebrews and you would probably have 85 90 percent of what is taught in the new testament in one book 1 peter 3 22 says who is gone into heaven yeshua and is on the right hand of god again angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him okay so he is above the angels he was made lower than the angels because he had to be made flesh and blood so that he could come and so that he could die and as i say we'll have a look at the reason why that had to happen um in a, a little bit in chapter two but all of the angelic authorities and all of the powers and all of the principalities were made subject unto him in revelation 5 11 to 12 tells us again uh, that the angels worship Yeshua. It says, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 uh, times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You see, Yeshua is his position as being higher than the angels will become important as we get into later chapters of the book and we see him as high priest in the heavenly tabernacle but this is just laying the foundation laying the groundwork so the author is just making it clear look he is in a unique exalted position he's the name above all names Okay, verse 5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Okay, he's not said that to any of the angels. Said it to Yeshua though. And again, when he bringeth uh, in the first begotten into the world, 
he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So what the author of Hebrews is doing here is he's quoting things out of the Tanakh and showing how they relate to Yeshua. Psalm 104 verse 1 to 4 says, Bless Yehovah, my soul, O Yehovah, my God. Thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chamber in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Okay, this is what the author of Hebrews is quoting here. And he's doing this for a very particular reason. As I say, he's going to establish Yeshua as high priest. He says here, his angels are ministers. It's a very particular word, okay? It's used here, ministers of flame of fire. Obviously in Hebrews here, it's a Greek word. In Psalm 104 here is a Hebrew word. Now the Greek word is uh, latergos, okay? And it is, it pertains to one who serves in the temple, okay? This is the, um, this is the role that the angels minister in, okay? They minister in the heavenly tabernacle, as we'll see, okay? In Revelation 8, 2 to 3, we can see the angels in the role ministering in the heavenly tabernacle. John says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So who offers the, uh, the incense on the golden altar? It's the priests in the earthly tabernacle okay and that's modeled after the heavenly tabernacle and who's doing it who is the minister in the heavenly tabernacle well it's the angels and as i say it's establishing the angels in this role they're ministering saying that yeshua is higher than the angels in this regard so it's going to establish yeshua as high priest as we get into the book of hebrews matthew 4 11 uses another term saying that the angels came and ministered unto him. Okay, this is after a temptation of Hasatan in the wilderness. It says, then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Okay, so we've got angels ministering again. This is what we have in the King James Version. Okay, same, same word, same English word, ministered, but it's a different Greek word. Okay, one means to minister as in the heavenly tabernacle but this isn't what the angels are doing here okay the uh the greek word is uh, diakoneo okay and it means to be a servant an attendant domestic to serve wait upon to minister to one uh to wait at a table and offer food to the guests you know so it's it's talking about uh ministering in the sense of being a servant, basically coming and serving somebody. Romans 15 verse 16 gives us another Greek word when it says, you sh um, Paul says that I should be the minister of Yeshua Messiah to the, uh, to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. You see, we've, we just have the same English word ministering. The angels minister in the heavenly tabernacle. Okay, the angels came and ministered to Yeshua. Now Paul is ministering the gospel of God, but it is another Greek word, okay? Diakonea. This one is talking about uh, being in the service of somebody, executing their commands, and particularly it highlights here being uh, in an office um, as pertaining to Yehovah. So this is what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about coming and serving somebody, ministering to them in that way. He's certainly not talking about ministering as in what would happen in the tabernacle, okay? This is a different form of ministering. And as, as we get into this, 
this will become more relevant. Psalm 103, 20 to 21 says, Bless Yehovah, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. It's quite an interesting verse. It says that the angels, okay, do his commandments and hearken to the voice of his word. Because obviously the angels have free will as well. Some of them fell and some of the angels do his commandments and hearken to the voice of his word. Bless ye Yehovah, all his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Okay. In the Masoretic text, because this is from the Psalms, this is in Hebrew, the word there, ministers, is shareth. Okay, but here we've got the word letergos. Okay, and as we saw before, that is talking about somebody who ministers in the heavenly tabernacle. Or ministers in the tabernacle. As it's talking about the angels here, it's talking about his ministers in the heavenly tabernacle that do his commandments, that hearken to the voice of his word. Okay, we, we see that the word letogos is used here because we've got uh, his, his ministers, Shareth, the word letogos here. That's the word that's used. It's talking about somebody who uh, ministers in the tabernacle. In Exodus 28, uh, verse 43, okay, we can see that this word is used of the people who minister in the earthly tabernacle as well. It says, And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come in near to the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto them and his seed after him. So exactly the same word is being used for the angels who minister in the heavenly tabernacle as for the earthly priests who minister in the earthly tabernacle. And that will really take on uh, some relevance in part three when we start to talk about uh, the difference between the earthly tabernacle and the, uh, the priests who are called after the order of Aaron and the heavenly tabernacle um, and Yeshua being high priest called after the order of Melchizedek. When we uh, begin to break that down, this kind of foundational material uh, will become a lot more relevant. Okay, and here uh, we see, again, the same word is used in the Greek, it's letergos, and the same word is used um, in the Hebrew, it's shirath. Okay, so we know that what the angels are doing and what the earthly ministers are doing is exactly the same thing. In Numbers 8, 24 to 26, it talks about the Levites. And again, it uses this word here uh, to minister. Okay, and it's the same word in the Hebrew. Uh, Sharath here. And it is the same word in the Greek. It's uh, Letergos here. So Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 continues. And it says something very interesting for... Uh, people who deny that Yeshua was God. Okay, it says, Unto the Son, to Yeshua, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So unto the Son, unto Yeshua, he addresses, and this is Yehovah that it's talking about, addresses him as God. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Okay, so it's called him God here. And then it says, your God has anointed you with oil. Okay, and this is uh, the meaning of Christ or Mashiach. It is anointed one. It is one who is anointed with oil. But if... Uh, it frazzles your head a little bit to think about how Yeshua could be God and then his God is telling him something and you know exactly how all of that works. I recommend uh, you go on our website uh, www.thewaybiblicalfellowship.com 
uh, go on the, uh, the video teaching, uh, teaching series, uh, look at the Butcher Doctrine series, and look at part seven. Um, it is a teaching on the Trinity, and it will lay all of this out for you in a way that perhaps you won't have heard before, uh, but that will reconcile every scripture, show how the Trinity doctrine isn't exactly right. It kind of it misses the mark, but it's, it's, it's kind of right in some ways. It's just, it's an interesting teaching. I, I recommend that you go um, and check it out. That's actually a quote. See, it says, Unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. It's a quote from Psalm 45, 6 to 7, which says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Okay, so he's saying, he's, he's looking at this part of the scripture and he's saying, this is said to the Son. Okay, because it's saying, O oh God, here. And then it says that your God has anointed you. Okay, anointed you. You are the anointed one. You are the Mashiach. Okay, so whoever the author of Hebrews is, he's pulling this out of uh, the Psalms and he's speaking to the Hebrews who will be very familiar with this. And he's saying, look at this. Okay, who do you think he is uh, addressing here when he addresses him as God? And then he says that his God has anointed him. Okay. Isaiah 64, verse 6. This is a fantastic verse that people love to uh, quote. Um, we see in Psalm 45, verse 7, and also where it's quoted in Hebrews, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Or in the Masoretic text, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Okay? You love righteousness. That's what it's saying here. That's what it says in Hebrews. Yet people will quote this verse as saying, all our righteousness, uh, righteousnesses are as filthy rags. See, Yehovah doesn't want us to do any righteousness. Any righteousness that we do is as filthy rags before him. We need the righteousness of Jesus. Sounds like an appealing doctrine. It's complete nonsense and it makes the rest of scripture a complete lie says that Yehovah loves righteousness and hates iniquity. Okay, so what's going on here? Isaiah, when he says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we, do, and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, he's saying, look, we are in such a poor condition that even the best of what we've done it's like filthy rags before you. He's not saying that they are a righteous people and that they, their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Yehovah just disregards it and says, oh, I don't care if you're being righteous. You haven't got the righteousness of Jesus, so it's like filthy rags to me. No, Isaiah is saying, okay, the very best of what this people has done is as filthy rags. It's nothing. It is, it is not righteousness at all. Okay? we can see that Yehovah has actually put something in his word to show us this, that righteousness is not as filthy rags. Righteousness is, as it says here, as fine linen. Revelation 19, 7 to 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Okay, his, his wife, his bride, has made herself ready. Okay, none of this nonsense doctrine about Yehovah will do all of the work, no, it doesn't say Yehovah has made his wife ready. It says that his, his wife has made herself ready. And how has she made herself ready? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Okay, and just <laughs> because I know that people will look at this and say, yes, the fine linen that we are dressed in is the righteousness of Jesus Okay, King James didn't foresee this nonsense doctrine, so he thinks that righteousness is enough, that it, it kind of encapsulates what's being said enough. And it does. To me, it certainly does. This is what it says in the NASB, though. 
Um, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. <laughs> Just in case anybody wants to say that it's the righteousness of Jesus that um, the bride is clothed in, it's not. It's the righteous acts that are done. And they're, they're not as filthy rags, they're as fine linen. 1 John 3, 7 talks about people coming along and trying to fool you with this doctrine. Oh, we, we have the righteousness of Jesus. No, John says, little children, let no man deceive you. Okay, people are going to come and try and deceive you about this. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that doeth righteousness. He that actually carries out these things. And we'll see what righteousness actually is uh, in a little bit. But it's him that does righteousness who is righteous in Yahuwah's sight. Yahuwah loves the righteous. He hates the wicked. Okay, he hasn't changed that. He hasn't changed his mind and gone, oh, you know what? Actually, I hate the righteous as well. The only one that I really like is Jesus. So if you, if you want to be in my good books, you've got to put on Jesus whatever that looks like, um, and then be dressed in his righteousness because only if Jesus does these acts are they pleasing in my sight. No, it's complete nonsense, okay? If we do righteous acts before Yehovah, okay, he values that. That's what he wants us to return to doing. He wants the citizens of his kingdom to do righteousness, Okay, righteousness is, as we will see, the only thing that remains when the world is destroyed. Now we'll get into that in a little bit. Psalm 119 shows us what righteousness is. When it says, he that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. What is it to do righteousness? Verse 40 says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Okay, precepts righteousness. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Okay? Righteousness, law. Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Okay? Righteousness is judgments. His judgments are righteous. Do his judgments and you will be doing righteousness. And verse 172 says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Don't forget, he who does righteousness, he who does his precepts, his law, his judgments, his commandments, is righteous, even as Yeshua is righteous. Why? Because Yeshua did all of these things. He lived a sinless life. We are called to repent of sin, the transgression of the law, to turn back to doing righteousness. Hasatan has done such a number on believers today to make them think that the law has been abandoned, that Jesus came and did the law, so we don't have to do it anymore. Psalm 11 verse 5, okay, this is one for people who say uh, love the sin, hate the sinner, that's what God does, he loves he, uh, no, sorry, wrong way around. They say, he loves the sinner and hates the sin. Well, that is completely against what the word of God actually says about how he feels about the sinner. It says, Yehovah trieth the righteous. Okay, those who walk in righteousness, he tests them to see whether it is in their hearts to keep his commandments. He tests the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth okay so it's not love the sinner and hate the sin from Yahuwah's perspective he hates the sinner it is antithetical to his soul okay Hebrews 1 9 says thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity therefore God even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows okay so this is obviously this quoting from uh, Psalm 45 at the beginning here. Well, it says that 
the Mashiach, how he is anointed is that he is anointed with the oil of gladness. And that's a quote from Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord Yahuwah is upon me. This is what Yeshua uh, read out in the synagogue. The Spirit uh, of Yahuwah is upon me because Yahuwah hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And you might actually notice that what Yeshua said is very slightly uh, different to what is actually written in the Masoretic text. If, however, you read the text of the Septuagint, then what Yeshua is quoting is directly from the Septuagint. The Masoretic text is a later text than the text of the Septuagint. So it appears that it has been changed. And all of the quotes in the New Testament, when they're a little bit different from what's written in the Hebrew, they are taken from uh, the Septuagint. Every single one of the quotes in the New Testament is taken from the Septuagint, not from the Masoretic text. Verse 2 says, To proclaim the acceptable year of Yehovah. Okay, that's where Yeshua stopped reading because that was what, what he had come to fulfill. What he will fulfill in his second coming is this bit. It says, And the day of vengeance to our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy. Okay, in the Septuagint version, it says the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yehovah, that he might be glorified. Okay, there's so much in this, where we can see that we are to be planted as trees of righteousness. Okay? We are to do Yehovah's uh, commandments, we're to do his judgments, his precepts, his law. Why? Why are we established in that way by Yehovah? That he might be glorified. Okay, it talks in Deuteronomy um, chapter 4 about the other nations looking upon the people who are following these commandments and they say, what other nation is it that has a God that has given laws so righteous as these? Okay, these are the same laws that have been spoken badly of by the church that have been called bondage. But we're supposed to be planted as trees of righteousness so that he is glorified. Okay, we're to transform our lives, to repent of sin, to turn from doing what is bad to doing what is righteous. Okay, Hebrews 1 verse 10 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Okay, so it says, it says here that that's to be changed. Okay, the heavens and the earth are going to be changed. And it's a quote uh, from Psalm 102. Verse 25 says, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Okay, so we have New Testament scripture, book of Hebrews again. It's quoting something from the Tanakh. It's quoting something that these people would be familiar with, and it's explaining um, what it means in context. But in both of them, it says something interesting. They shall be changed. Okay, the heavens and the earth shall be changed. Hmm. Yeshua speaks of a time when everything's going to be changed. And Yeshua said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, okay, this is a little bit different to what is commonly taught in most seminaries, uh, theology classes, the change that will happen to the heavens and the earth is that they will be regenerated. Okay, what actually happens is all of the bad, all of the corruption is um, purged away, as we'll see. 
But he speaks uh, of the millennial kingdom. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And he refers to this period as the regeneration. Okay, when things are made new. It's not, we, when we think of a new heavens and a new earth, we think of something akin to Yehovah creating another area of space-time um, that we all go to dwell in. And then this one is uh, destroyed, it's burnt up by fire, and we all go and dwell in the new one. That's not actually what Scripture says uh, will happen, as we'll see. Isaiah 51, 4 to 8, speaks of this, uh, this time when the heavens and the earth uh, will perish. It says, Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. What does it say? What is the part of it that remains? My righteousness shall not be abolished. Okay, this is the only thing that has any permanence. Okay, anything that is founded in his righteousness because that comes from him that is unchanging that's never going to fade away that's never going to perish so everything else all of the corruption of the world is going to perish it is going to fade away but his righteousness shall not be abolished hearken unto me ye that know righteousness the people in whose heart is my law fear ye not the reproach of men neither be you afraid of their revilings okay so his people the ones who are going to be left in his kingdom are the ones that know righteousness. Okay, what's righteousness again according to the scriptures? It's his Torah, his law, his commandments, his judgments, his precepts. Okay, the people in whose heart is my law. Okay, you know righteousness in your heart is my law. Verse 8 says, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Okay, so everything else is going to fade away. Everything else is going to be burnt up by fire, we're told elsewhere. The only thing that will remain is his righteousness, things that are founded upon his righteousness. Hebrews 12, 26 to 28 talks about this time. It says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Okay, this is when the heavens and the earth fade away. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, we're raised incorruptible. What is corruptible, that which can be shaken, is it, um, as it phrases it here, is going to pass away. The only thing that will remain is that which cannot be shaken, his righteousness and those things that are founded thereon. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Okay? Knowing that the only things that are going to survive are that which is founded on his righteousness, that which is unshakable, that which is not corrupted by sin, by the things of the world, knowing that that is the only thing that is going uh, to have permanence that's going to remain, let us serve God with godly fear. Okay, let us build these things which are going to remain. Let it all be built upon the word of God. Let it all be built upon his righteousness because that is the only thing which is not going to be shaken. Everything else is going to pass away. And when everything else is passed away, we will have a new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 34 verse 4 says, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. So all the angels, they'll be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from off the fig tree. You remember that the angels have 
free will as well. Some of them do his commandments. Some of them hearken to the voice of his word. Some of them don't. They're going to pass away as well because they're not going to be founded in righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? All of that's going to perish. It's all going to pass away. It's all going to be burnt up. So what manner of person should we be if we want to remain? Okay, we need to be founded in his righteousness. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. What dwells in the new heavens and the new earth? What's the only thing that has permanence? The only thing that will not be abolished? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay? This is why it's so important to walk in righteousness. I mean, if you don't want to see this, if you don't want to see that walking in his law is the right thing to do, then that's fine. <laughs> you're choosing for yourself whether or not you're going to be there in his kingdom because the only thing that's going to dwell in his kingdom is righteousness. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15 tells us the same thing. It says, but other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Yeshua Messiah. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, is it going to remain? Does it have any permanence? Is it founded on Yeshua? Is it founded in righteousness? If any man's work abide, which he hath uh, built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If he's walking in righteousness, of course. A man's works have to be built upon this. A man's works have to be built after righteousness. Otherwise, it's got no permanence. It's just going to be burnt up. Everything is going to be burnt up. Everything corruptible is going to be burnt up. And the only thing that is going to be left is that which is un incorruptible. And it's only incorruptible because it's founded in Yahuwah. Okay, it comes from him. It's his nature. It is his law. It's his statutes. It's his judgments. Everything that comes forth from him is going to remain. Everything else is going to be burnt up. Okay, so when Isaiah says all oh, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, he certainly doesn't mean don't do righteousness. Okay, Hebrews 1.13 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, again, we've got this uh, focus on Yeshua being higher than the angels. That's a quote from Psalm 110. Okay, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he's saying, look, this is being said to Mashiach. And as we uh, get into Hebrews, we'll see that Psalm 110 becomes uh, more relevant um, because it's the, it's the scripture that talks about uh, Yeshua being called um, as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, but we'll, we'll look th at that as we go along. But for now... The author is just introducing this and saying, look, this passage is talking to Mashiach as well. Verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Okay, so the angels, introducing the information here, that they are spirits. Okay, it's going to talk about the uh, significance of him being made in flesh and blood in a little bit. Well, for now, let's look at this, word, this verse. Ministering and minister. Let's look at these words. Okay, we can see. Ministering is uh, letergos. Minister is uh, diakonia. 
Okay, Letergos, if you remember, means to minister in the heavenly tabernacle, when it's applied to angels at least. Okay, so they are ministering spirits, okay? And they're sent forth to minister in a different way. Okay, diakonia means same when Paul says, I, I've come to minister the gospel, okay? They minister in exactly the same way. We miss these things uh, when we just read it in the English. Ministering spirit sent forth to minister. Well, that would make sense. That they would be sent forth to minister if they're ministering spirits. It's actually talking about two different functions here. Okay, they shall be sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. We had the little look at the idea of uh, Yeshua being the heir, um, the heir of the kingdom, but us as heirs of salvation. Let's have a look at that as well. In Romans 8, 16 to, 8, uh, 16 to 17, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Messiah. Okay, so he is the heir of the kingdom. And we are joint heirs with him, also being the children of God. Galatians 3.26 tells us that ye are the children of God by faith in Messiah Yeshua. Now does this just mean that if you profess to believe in Jesus, that you are therefore one of the children of God? Well, no, it doesn't. We're, we're told all the way through Scripture, and particularly as we will see as we get into it in the book of Hebrews, that faith is accompanied by works, by obedience, okay? It is shown uh, by works, meet for repentance. It is shown by the fact that we have turned back to following Torah, that we have faith in Messiah. What did Messiah do? Messiah walked in the Torah, and we have faith in him. We're told that if we are in him, then we will walk even as he walked, Okay, we're obviously meant to take him as our model and walk in obedience just as he walked in obedience. Okay, Hebrews chapter 2 then, verse 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Okay, this really, this next section of scripture, this really is a challenge for anybody who believes in the nonsense of once saved, always saved. Okay, Paul saying, no, we've got to give earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Okay, what, what would be the consequence of letting them slip? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2 says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in mind what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Really not a position that anybody wants to be in, that they have believed in vain. Okay? We should take the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Keep in memory what I preach to you, unless ye have believed in vain. Deuteronomy uh, 4 verse 9 talks in very similar terms. It says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy, thy life. So just like the author of Hebrews is saying here, he's saying, give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And like Paul saying here, keep in memory what's been preached to you, or you, you may have believed in vain. It's exactly the same in Deuteronomy 4, when it says, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Keep thy soul diligently. Okay, pay, pay earnest heed to it. Hebrews 2.2 2 says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Okay, so what's the, the word spoken by angels? It's important for us to understand before we go on. In Acts 7, it tells us, in verse 52, it says, which 
of the prophets have your uh, fathers not persecuted? Sorry, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So what was the word that was spoken of, uh, that was spoken by angels? It was the law. So, for if the word spoken by angels, for if the law was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Okay, so if the law has, um, if your transgressions under the law receive a just recompense of reward, what about us? We've had so great a salvation, okay? We have been given grace for our transgressions. They've been forgiven us, okay? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We've been given this grace now. If we neglect this salvation and just walk back in the ways of the world, how will we escape? Okay, just those people who've broken the law, they were under a certain punishment. How will we escape if we walk away from it? And it's echoed later on in Hebrews in chapter 10. It says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That is the just recompense of reward that it's talking about under the law here. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Okay, so he has been given grace for his transgressions. He has been sanctified. He's been cleansed of all of his sin. Then he just casts that aside. He tramples it underfoot. Okay, the, the law had the sore punishment, which was death. How much sore punishment is somebody who takes the grace, takes the sanctification from all of the sin, from all of their transgressions of the law, takes the Lord's forgiveness, just casts it aside and continues to walk in sin, continues to transgress his law. Exact mirroring of what it says in Hebrews 2 verse 3 here where it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Psalm 103, 20 to 21 says, Bless Yehovah, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Again, the angels keeping the commandments. Bless ye Yehovah, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Proverbs 2, 1 to 9, shows us that this is equally applicable to us. And just like the angels who keep his commandments when the heavens pass away and they, the righteous are the only ones that are left. Only the people who do this, who take it to heart, who write it upon their hearts are going to be the ones who are left because what they have done will be, found, they, uh, will be founded on righteousness. They will have received grace for their past transgressions, okay? Their past unrighteousnesses, they've received grace. They've received forgiveness for them. Now they've repented and they've turned back to following the law of Yehovah. Verse 1 says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear to wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of Yehovah and find the knowledge of God. For Yehovah giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Oh no, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God. No, that is clearly denying what the word says. Anyway, he keepeth the paths of judgment, of judgment and he preserveth the way of his saints. What's going to be the only thing that is preserved, the only thing that has got permanence? Okay, it's going to be righteousness. It's going to be the way of his saints. That's what's going to be preserved. 
Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, in every good path. When you see that the only thing that is going to remain is righteousness, then you will understand the value of it and you will understand just how worthless the things of the world are. So you'll understand just how worthless the things that your flesh desires and goes after actually are because they're not founded on righteousness. Then you'll understand righteousness. Then you'll understand judgment as well. And equity. Yeah? And every good path. So just like the angels were to walk in his commandments. Were to do after the voice of his word. Proverbs 7, 1 to 2 says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law is the apple of thine eye. How can people know that things like this are written in Scripture and still say that the law is done away with or that it's bondage, or that it's bad in any way? Yehovah you know, consistently says how amazing his law is, how it will bring life, abundant life, which is what Yeshua said that he'd come to bring. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 to 12 says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay? It's an example to us. The things that they got wrong, okay, and they did. They went after all of these things. It says, Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, quoting uh, the uh, account of the golden calf. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000, talking about the sin at uh, Baal Pure. Neither let us tempt Messiah as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Another fantastic verse if anybody says that Messiah is not God. They tempted Messiah in the wilderness, and we know that the one that they tempted was God. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for examples, for they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Take earnest heed to yourself to remember these things which are spoken. If you think that you stand, if you think, I'm saved, it, it, it's all done by Jesus. Take heed because you can fall. Once saved, always saved is a fairy tale doctrine that is believed by people who like to sin but also like to believe that it's fine. Hebrews 12 verse 25 says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Okay, again, we've got Moses and Yeshua. Moses spoke the law. Yeshua spoke the law. If they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, Moses, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Okay? What did Yeshua speak? Many people will tell you that Yeshua never told his disciples to keep the law. Matthew 4 verse 17 says, From that time Yeshua began to preach what was Yeshua preaching? What is the one that speaks from heaven? What does he say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What are the people that Yeshua is speaking to? What, what, what are they going to repent and begin to do? Well, they've been transgressing the law of God. They repented. They began to follow the law of God. That's exactly what he was preaching. But perhaps that's, that's not concrete enough. For some people, okay, repentance will make repentance mean something else, and you know, 
maybe he's saying believe in me even though they, uh, he'd not died or you know whatever nonsense people come up with maybe they need something a bit more direct than that Matthew 23 1 to 3 says then spake Yeshua to the multitude and to his disciples saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat from where the Torah was preached all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do observe and do the Torah couldn't get a much clearer, clearer command, observe and do the Torah. Whatever they bid you observe and do, when they sat in Moses' seat, that observe and do. This is a direct commandment to us today. And people will come with the nonsense and say, no, this was, this was Yeshua speaking to the Jews. This was before the cross. Of course he's telling the Jews to uh, obey the, the Torah. Yeshua is speaking to the multitude and to his disciples. And this is what he commands them. This is before the cross. It's only just before the cross. It's one of the last things that he actually said to them that's recorded before the cross. But let's just, let's just assume that maybe he was just, you know, really hammering home the point about the Jews keeping the law just for no reason, just before he went to the cross. Let's just say that that's true. Okay, if we look at Matthew 28, this is after the cross. So what does he tell his disciples? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Ghost. Or, as the earliest manuscripts say, baptizing them in my name, which is, if you look at the book of Acts, what they actually do. They never baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That was a, a later addition. But regardless, okay. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You know all of those things that I told you about keeping the Torah of Moses? Go and teach all nations to do all of those things. Direct commandment of Yeshua to keep the Torah the one who speaks from heaven speaks the same thing as the one who speaks on earth if we disobey the one on earth then we have a certain punishment that's laid out in the Torah of how much sore punishment shall he be counted worthy who hath trampled underfoot the blood of the covenant whereby he was sanctified hmm 2.3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoke by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, the Ruach HaKadosh, according to his own will. Okay. It's interesting because this is talking about the people in the wilderness. God bear uh, bore them witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles of course he did that to the, the children of Israel in the wilderness gifts of the Holy Ghost hmm if that doesn't make sense to you then you're thinking well the gifts of the spirit they're a, a New Testament thing go to the website www.thewaybiblicalfellowship.com go to video teachings go to teaching series go to Butchered Doctrine Part 6, Pentecost and the giving of the Spirit. Check it out, because if you think that this was a New Testament thing, even though it says here that it, it wasn't, it happened in the Old Testament, if that is the theology that you've been taught, go and check out that teaching. Okay, Deuteronomy 32, 46 to 47 says, And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you, this day which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. Sounds a bit like what Yeshua said to them, doesn't it? For it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life. Hey, like Paul said, the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. Okay, it's, it's not about salvation. Keeping the law is not about salvation. Keep the law, not, never going to save you. 
because you will have always sinned, you will have always transgressed. You need Yeshua's death for a reason that we will come to in um, a little bit. The thing that the Lord does achieve though is it brings life. It is your life. Okay? And it is as well the righteousness upon which your life is founded so that when everything is burnt up, your life founded on righteousness is going to remain. 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22 tells us, again, this is a fantastic one for the once saved, always saved crowd. It says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Messiah, okay, so you've got that which is permanent, you've got righteousness, that which comes forth from God, and then you've got the pollutions of the world, that which is corrupted, um, what is righteous. Okay, it's, it's a, a corruption, a perversion. So if, after, if they've escaped those things through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Yeshua Messiah, they are again entangled therein and overcome. Okay, so they go after the world, they go after all of that corruption, that perversion, nonsense. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Okay, so it's not even a case of, oh, well, you know, you, you've lost your salvation. It's worse for you at that, ki- at that point because you actually have more culpability because you've come to a knowledge of what is right, what is holy, what is acceptable before Yehovah. And then you've gone, no, actually, that's a load of rubbish. I want all of this nonsense of the world, all of these pollutions of the world. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Okay, to turn from that righteousness. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to turn from the holy commandment that is given to them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned again to his own vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. See, we are cleansed of our sin. We've been washed. We can, however, at that point, return to wallowing in the mire. We can go after the pollutions of the world and it's worse for us at that point. For unto the angels hath he not put into subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Now this is an interesting verse. It says that he's not put the world to come into the subjection of the angels. Okay, drawing the parallel between Yeshua he is reigning over that and he's not put uh, the world to come into the subjection of the angels so it's again elevating Yeshua above the angels but in Revelation 5 8 to 10 it's th- this verse shows us in um, along with this verse that the 24 elders are not angels okay a lot of people will tell you that the, the 24 elders are uh, angelic beings. But th- this proves that they're not when uh, read in the light of Hebrews 2.5. It says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, if the angels aren't going to reign on the earth then the four and twenty elders aren't angels. 2 Timothy 2.12 tells us if we suffer we shall also reign with him. If we deny him then he will also deny us. And to deny him isn't to, you know, to say, I deny Jesus. To deny him is to see the the way of righteousness, to see the holy commandment that's delivered unto you, and then to turn from it. Okay, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation as we've received? If we trample under the underfoot the blood of the covenant whereby we were sanctified, whereby we were washed clean, if we take that 
and then we just return to the pollutions of the world we are denying him and if we deny him he'll deny us Revelation 20 verse 6 says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years 1 Corinthians 6 2 to 3 tells us do ye not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels Okay, the angels, uh, the world to come is not going to be in subjection to the angels. It is going to be in subjection to us. We are going to reign with Messiah. It tells us here that we're actually going to judge the angels as well. Okay, Hebrews 2 verse 6 says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor and did set over him the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is put, uh, not put under him. Okay. This is a quote. Uh, the Masoretic text has it very slightly differently. In the uh, Septuagint version, it's exactly what is said there but the Masoretic text says uh, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands thou hast put all things under his feet so again the author of Hebrews is drawing this out of the Tanakh and showing um, the recipients the readers of Hebrews he's showing them who their Messiah is and he's bringing all of these scriptures to life for them in a way that no other New Testament epistle does and quite simply it's because it is addressed to the people who have had the Tanakh who've studied the scriptures for their entire life and it's bringing out all of these things and proving who the Messiah is to them okay Psalm 8 verse 5 says something different in the NASB version you see you notice here that it says he's made them a little lower than the angels and that is a quote from um, from Hebrews 2 it says that he's made them a little lower than the angels the NASB version it says yet you have made them a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty so in in the Hebrew okay whether it was angels or God would be distinct okay if it was uh, angels it would be Malachim and if it was God it would be Elohim okay so if we have a look at the actual Hebrew text for the word that is used it's Elohim and it's translated as angels now interestingly we can see in the Septuagint version here that the word that's used is Agilos okay angels so again, we've got an example of the Septuagint being more accurate than the Masoretic text. I have no idea why in the Masoretic text it says you've made them a little lower than God. That is what it says. Okay, and at the end it says, but now we see, not yet, all things put under him. Okay, so this prophecy that's made in the scriptures the author of Hebrews says, okay, this is written, but now, at this current time, we see that not all things are made subject to him. And we see that in other New Testament writings. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 28, for as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, afterwards, they that are Messiahs are his coming. Okay, so... Messiah was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was raised um, a quickening spirit, okay? And uh, he has his spirit body. We will be raised with that nature if we are Messiahs at his coming, okay? Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign 
till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, what's the, the last thing to be cast into the lake of fire and destroyed? Okay, death and Hades. For he, put, he hath put all things under his feet. But when he say, saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. Okay, so Yehovah has put all things under Yeshua. But obviously he's not under him himself. Now, again, if this is kind of boggling your mind, well, if, if Yeshua is Yehovah, then how can Yehovah have put all things under Yeshua apart from Yehovah? Because surely, you know, surely that doesn't work. Again, watch the teaching of the Trinity and it, it'll become clear for you. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Wait there, how can, how can Yeshua be subject to himself? Ooh, what's going on? What's the teaching? Okay, Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Okay, now we're getting into an area of Hebrews where one of the most fantastic things in all of Scripture will be revealed. Okay, we've got a little, little hint out of here. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Why was he made lower than the angels? Why was he made in flesh as a, a son of Adam? So that he could suffer death. By the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. What, what's that talking about? <laughs> well, we'll see as we go along. Okay, Philippians 2, 7 to 9 fleshes this out a little bit for us. It says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And the true significance of what he did here to take on flesh and blood so that he could die, even the death of the cross, what he actually achieved will, will be getting into now. But this is why he had to be made a little lower than the angels. He had to be made in the likeness of men so that he could be obedient unto the death of the cross. 2.10 says, For it became him for whom are all things and by, uh, by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay, it was necessary for him to uh, suffer in this way in order to bring many sons to glory. We'll have a look at why. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Okay, a little bit weird language used here. He's delivered him up. Delivered him up to who? Delivered him up to himself? Hey, people ridicule Christians for that sort of uh, doctrine. Oh, he, he sacrificed them to himself. Let's try and understand exactly what's going on here. Okay, Hebrews 2.11 says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Right, okay. Who are the ones who he calls his brethren? Mark 3, 33 to 34 says, And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Okay, so these were the people that he's not ashamed to call his brethren, the ones who are sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? In Hebrews 10, verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua Messiah once for all. Okay, so we're sanctified through the offering of his body. Now this is something that we will 
uh, understand better when we get into um, later chapters of Hebrew, Hebrews where it, it really starts to break down the idea of this red heifer sacrifice. The, the red heifer sacrifice offered in the earthly temple is for the purifying of the flesh. And Yeshua's our red heifer sacrifice was for the purifying of the conscience. It was for our sanctification. But just for now, we're sanctified through the offering of his body. Wherefore, Yeshua also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Okay, it was his blood that was mixed with living waters, which is the, the Ruach, which form the waters of separation, the, uh, the waters by which we are sanctified, parallel to the, the red heifer sacrifice waters of se uh, separation. But again, if that doesn't really make sense at this point, either wait until we get a little bit further into the book of Hebrews, or again, if you look at the, the teaching Pentecost and the giving of the Spirit, that I'll have uh, some additional information in. John 17, 16 to 19, this is when Yeshua is praying for his disciples. He says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. Okay, he sanctifies himself according to the word. Okay, he lived a sinless life and he did it for their sakes, he's saying, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Okay, he was sinless. He was blemishless so that he uh, fulfilled the requirements for the red heifer sacrifice so that they also could be sanctified. So if he wasn't sanctified, he wouldn't be able to be the red heifer sacrifice and they wouldn't be able to be sanctified. So he sanctifies himself that they may also be sanctified through the truth. Ephesians 5, 25 to 26 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, so he gave himself for the church. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it. Okay, again, we're talking about the red heifer sacrifice here. With the washing of water by the word. This washing of water, the waters of separation. So, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. That's a quote from Psalm 22, 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I, will I praise thee? Now it's saying that he is not ashamed to call them brethren who are sanctified. How does he call them brethren who are sanctified? He will declare Yehovah's name unto his brethren. How does he declare his name? How does he sanctify them? By the washing of the water, by the word. He sanctifies himself according to the word. Following the word declares Yehovah's name. Doing righteousness in the sight of the nations, say, that declares Yehovah's name to them. It declares who he is so that they look upon the acts of righteousness, they look upon the physical manifestations of who Yehovah is that we carry out in the world and they uh, declare his name. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Okay, I will wash them with the waters of the word. I'll declare your name to them. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Again, we have this kind of very... A uh, very set way of looking at praise and worship. Okay, but to truly praise and worship Yehovah is to emulate him and to, to say, look, he is good. He is the standard of righteousness and he is the way that I will live out my life because I praise, I worship, I reverence him. I declare his name. Okay, Hebrews 2.13 says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me 
So the author is saying here, again, it is written somewhere else in scripture, I will put my trust in him. Again, somewhere else it says, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, so I will put my trust in him. Could come from several uh, different sources uh, in the Tanakh, but I think that this is the most likely as a quotation. Psalm 56 verse 3 says, what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Okay, the quotation of Behold, I and the children of God, uh, children which God hath given me. Quotation from Isaiah 8:18. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah hath given me. Okay, Hebrews 2:14. Now, you see how uh, the author of Hebrews has been drawing these things out of the Tanakh to show who Messiah is. Now he's really going to hit them with something amazing. Okay, a mystery uh, within the Tanakh. Uh, that is unsolved. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Okay, so the children, me and you, they're partakers of flesh and blood, they're flesh and blood beings. So he also himself likewise took part of the same. He's made a little lower than the angels. That through death, which is why he was made a little lower than the angels. He was made in flesh so that he could suffer this death. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now that is an amazing, amazing statement. And we'll unpack it a little bit so that you can understand exactly what was going on here. John 12, 31 to 32 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Prince of this world, Hasatan. Okay. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So he's talking about his death. And he's saying that his death is going to draw all men to him. And he's going to cast out Hasatan. Here, it says that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So through death, he would destroy him who had the power of death. 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 6 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Interesting, isn't it? Anyone want to say that Yeshua wasn't God? Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Okay, what's the truth? The Torah. Okay, your law is the truth. You'll have all men to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Messiah, Yeshua. Again, if that statement is puzzling to you, how can he be God and be the mediator between men and God? And, you know, how does all that work? Trinity teach him. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That's the important thing. Okay, he gave himself as a ransom. Think about a, what a ransom is. Who do you pay the ransom to? Do you pay the ransom to the parent of the one who's kidnapped? You don't. You pay the ransom to the one who is kidnapping the children. It says in Matthew twenty twenty eight, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, think about what a ransom is and who a ransom is paid for or paid to. It's not paid to Yehovah. This is who the ransom is paid to. The one that had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, they had put themselves under this power of death in a way that we'll have a look at. And the ransom was paid to Hasatan in order to free them. And what was the ransom price that was asked? It was his life. Okay, so he paid with his life to redeem all of the people who were under the power of death. Galatians 1.4 says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, might deliver us from the power of death which is in the hands of Hasatam. 1 John 5, 18 to 19 says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. That's an interesting one, isn't it, for anybody who's in deliverance ministry. 
We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. What is the power of the evil one? It's the power of death, which is in the hands of the evil one. Through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. See, Ezekiel 18 verse 4 tells us why he has the power of death over us. It says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Okay, so we voluntarily, of our own free will, put ourselves under the power of death that's in the hands of Hasatam. The soul that sins, it shall die. Okay, so the power of death is in the hands of Hasatan. So if we sin, then we are under his power. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Ooh, that's a, another good one for the Yeshua wasn't Yehovah crowd. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now this is the important bit here. He was justified in the spirit. You see, if he paid the ransom price, which was his blood, and he died, and he was under that decree of Yehovah, the soul that sins shall die, then that would have been the end of the Messiah and Hasatan would have won. However, because he lived a sinless life, because he was justified in the spirit, he was not under the maxim of the soul that sins shall die. So Yeshua rose from the dead. He defeated death because he was sinless. He paid the ransom price. We could all go free then because he had paid our ransom for us. However, Hasatan didn't win. He outsmarted Hasatan. He rose from the dead. Death could not hold him. Colossians 1, 21 to 22 says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Okay, through his death, he has reconciled us. Again, it highlights the importance that he had to come in the flesh in order to be able to die. Isaiah 53, 4 to 5 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Okay. People who saw him up on the cross mocked him and told him to have God save him. So they esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But we do the same when we teach the doctrine that Yehovah had to punish somebody, so he punished his son. He put him to an excruciating death just to satisfy his idea of justice. We're teaching that Yeshua was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted as well. That's how we've esteemed him. But... He was wounded for our transgressions. The soul that sins shall die. We've transgressed. We've put ourselves under that power of death. So he was wounded for our transgressions to pay the ransom. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. See, we just live at peace. The chastisement for that. The chastisement for our life of wanton sin was upon him and with his stripes we are healed we are brought back to restoration through the ransom that he's paid Amos 3 7 says surely the Lord Yehovah will do nothing but he revealeth the secret unto his servants the prophets so if this idea of the ransom is seen in the Brit uh, Hadashah the New Testament it must be somewhere in the writings of the prophets too. He must have revealed this first to the prophets. And he did. He revealed it to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 verse 11 says, For Yehovah hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Okay. Who was the hand of him that was stronger than he? Hasatan. Isaiah 25 uh, verse 8. He will swallow up death 
in victory. And there are various places throughout the Tanakh that this can be seen. Just highlight these two because they're the two that come to mind. The early church knew that this was the situation. And not that I'm saying that the early church knowing adds validity to any idea because the early church had a load of wacky, crazy ideas. But they recognized this as well. They said, Christ is our redemption because we have become prisoners and needed ransoming. That's origin. Irenaeus says, For at the first Adam became a vessel in Satan's possession, whom he did also hold under his power, power of death, power that he has. Acts twenty six eighteen says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan. What is the power of Satan? It's the power of death. Turn them from the power of death unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified. Okay? If Yehovah forgives them, but they're still under the power of death, then their souls are still going to be destroyed. So they're released from this power unto God. They receive the forgiveness of their sins. Then they can receive the inheritance among them which are sanctified. You see how all of these themes are tied together, how they are throughout all of the New Testament. The idea of the inheritance as children, um, the idea of being sanctified, Okay, what, what is being sanctified? Is it just a poetic phrase? No, it's talking about Yeshua as the red heifer sacrifice, cleansing us of our transgressions, of our iniquity, of our sin, so that we can then turn in repentance to Yehovah and walk out righteousness, having been freed from the power of Satan, the power of death, which is in the hands of the devil. Colossians 1, 12 to 13 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We know what the power of darkness is. It's the power of death. He's translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Okay, well, that's interesting. This is the only... Uh, other time, apart from the next scripture that this word translated is used, and this next scripture is so commonly mistaught, it's just misunderstood. Okay, Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Okay, so people have got this idea of the rapture doctrine, and they, Enoch was somehow raptured into heaven so that he never died. Well, no. What is it to be translated? To find for us here, translated into the kingdom of his dear son to be taken away to be delivered from this power of darkness okay the power of death he's translated removed from the power of death so that he should not see death now does this mean his physical body will not die of course it doesn't Yeshua uses this phrase himself in John 8 51 he says verily verily I say unto you if a man keep my saying he shall never see death is this saying that if someone keeps his word that they're never going to die, that they'll be immortal? Of course it's not. It's talking about the same thing, that we are taken from the power of death in the hands of Hasatan, that our soul will not die. Enoch's soul will not die. Why? Because he walked with God and he was translated into the kingdom. Okay, it's not some kind of mystery thing that we, we go and write books about and all kinds of crazy theories and say the, the rapture is a real thing because Enoch was raptured and Elijah was raptured which is a whole different thing that we can get into some other time watch in fact Butcher Doctrine part 10 uh, Life After Death part 2 um, see what happened with Elijah but Enoch did not not die in the physical he simply will not see death in the same way that we will not see death because we have been granted eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says, For the love of Messiah constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Okay? And that he died for all, that they which live should not, live, should not henceforth live unto themselves and unto him which died for them, but unto him that died for them and rose again. So we were under this sentence of death. 
we now are not under the sentence of death so the life that we live should be unto the one who died and rose again from the dead to us how do we live unto Yeshua well we're told that if we're in Yeshua then we will walk even as he walked he walked according to the Torah he walked according to righteousness we repent we uh, are restored we begin to walk again in righteousness and then when everything perishes all that is left is the righteousness and we will inherit the kingdom Revelation 1.18 says I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore amen and have the keys of hell and of death the word there being Hades it's talking about Sheol it's not talking about hell as we have a common concept of it if you wonder what that that's all about Hades Sheol what this is with uh, Hades and death and all of that sort of thing Butcher Doctrine Part 9 uh, Life After Death Part 1 okay well, Yeshua says I'm he that was alive died rose from the dead now I have eternal life now I've got the keys of Hades and death the power of death is no longer in the hands of Hasatan 2 Corinthians 1 9 to 10 says but we had the sentence of death in ourselves so that sin shall die that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead you see Yahuwah has a purpose in all of these things he knew that the power of death would end up in the hands of Hasatan and he used it for his glory he used it so that we would come to an end of our self because we had the sentence of death in ourselves we had put ourselves under the death sentence the only one that we could trust for redemption, for salvation from this death penalty that we had imposed upon ourselves is God who delivered us from so great a death, okay? Hebrews now goes on in verse 15 to talk about this deliverance and says, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Okay, so he's delivered us. Now all their life they were uh, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage okay we see this also talked about by Paul in Romans 8 15 it says for ye have not received the bondage again to fear the spirit of bondage again to fear what is this spirit of bondage again to fear again is it just a poetic phrase no he delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage we've been delivered from that but we've not received again the spirit of bondage to fear the fear that it's talking about is the fear of death once had uh, heard a pastor explain this by saying we no longer fear God we have been adopted as sons but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father again do you see all of these themes tying together of the heirs of salvation being co-heirs with Messiah okay we've received the spirit of adoption we are now sons of Yehovah children of Yehovah okay so I'm going to read the last five or six verses that we've read in Hebrews uh, and then we will continue on in Hebrews 2 verse 9 says but we see Yeshua who is, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man okay let's make a little bit more sense now for it became him who, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee and again I will put my trust in him and again behold I and the children which God hath given me for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage Hebrews is such an integral part of the New Testament 
Without it, we would be missing all of this depth, all of this color, all of this explanation of the ransom that, Yahu, uh, that Yeshua paid for us, about what it achieved. Hebrews is such an integral part of the New Testament. I can't believe that people want to try and remove it simply because they do not understand things that are within it. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him uh, the seed of Abraham, okay? Didn't take on the nature of angels, took on human flesh so that he could die, so that he could pay the ransom for us. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now it's talking about him in his high priestly role. It's talking about what it achieved for him to be manifest in the flesh, for him to serve as high priest for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted okay to succor means to help so he being tempted is able to help those who are tempted because he has experienced exactly what we experience we're told this later on in hebrews In chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In all points he was tempted in the same way that we are, yet he had made the decision to walk in righteousness, to be the model for us to follow, to be our example. And one of the points that he was tempted in One of the infirmities that he experienced is pretty mind-blowing. And talks about it in Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 8. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. What point was Yeshua crying out to him who could save him from death and became obedient through these things to the garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22 verse 41 it says and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly in his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And that's something that happens. It's a real medical condition. To sweat blood is something that happens when somebody is imminently going to die. Okay? At this moment, it says being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Okay? He was in complete terror at this point the fear that had come upon him about what he was about to experience and he said to Yehovah if you are willing take this cup from me I don't want to suffer this if you're willing please take it from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done We must say this. Yehovah's will is revealed in his Torah. Psalm 40 verse 8 tells us that. If we are in a situation where our will doesn't want to keep the Torah, perhaps out of fear of something, perhaps out of fear even of something as small as the fear of man. What will man think? What will man say if I don't do this? What will man say if I don't do that? Surely I've got to transgress the commandments. I've got to sin. No, Yeshua was in much greater fear. He was about to die this horrific death. He was sweating blood. And he was in desperation at this point. And he calls out to his father, the one who can save him from death. And he prays and asks him, "If if you're willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not, not my will, but thine be done. So if we are in a situation where we're tempted to sin, 
especially through fear. And we have to remember Yeshua's example. He knows what it is to come and to be tempted and to still live a sinless life. He knows that it is possible to do that. He was in the most extreme fear at this point. And still he became obedient. Obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He's our example. So if we can take anything from the book of Hebrews, take from it that God became flesh so that he could come and die. He could pay the ransom to Hasatan to free us all from this power of death so that we can all be restored to being able to walk righteously, to having our garments cleansed. And he came in the flesh so he knows what it's like to be tempted in all points as we are tempted. When we've come to him and we've repented, we no longer have an excuse to do these things. The only reason that we would walk back into the pollutions of the world is quite simply out of selfishness. Even if we're in a dire situation of fear like this, we must always stand on what Yeshua said. Not my will, but thine be done. Shalom.